Welcome to the Moved to Meditate podcast. I'm your host, Addie D. Hilster. If you're a yoga practitioner or teacher who knows that there's more to yoga than poses, but you're wondering where to find that, come join our quiet little party. Here you'll find resources to help you deepen your practice as well as insightful conversations with yoga, movement, and meditation teachers from a range of traditions. On this podcast, we spotlight the more contemplative aspects of movement practice. So we talk about all things gentle yoga, meditation, yin, restorative, yoga therapy, mindfulness, and more. Listen in and connect to a community of like-minded practitioners. Okay, hello everybody. This is Addie. I'm so happy to be back. I missed a week on the podcast last week because I had to travel home at short notice for my grandma's memorial. So it's really good to be back with you and sharing a podcast today on one of my favorite topics, which is getting your meditation practice started, or as I'm choosing to phrase it, so you think you can't meditate. (laughs) Uh, Spoiler alert, I think you probably can if you're interested. Right now, kind of in a related topic, equanimity is our current deeper dive theme. Equanimity, steadiness of mind, is totally a quality of of mind that develops out of our mindfulness meditation practice. So this is pretty related to the topic of the day. But let me tell you that (laughs) I had some opportunities to practice equanimity while flying across the country this week from Washington State to Birmingham, Alabama. That was my first big trip during the pandemic. It was not my first choice. (laughs) And it, of course, involved going through airports and wearing a mask on a long flight and seeing a lot of family and doing, you know, everyone just doing our best while being sad and exhausted and kind of trying to pull the details together for a memorial and then actually attending it and then kind of collapsing afterwards. So equanimity is a really important practice and I was I was so glad that I, I have that as a resource. I will be recording an equanimity meditation this week that will come out in a few days in my email newsletter. If you're on the email list, you'll be getting that. So it'll be good if you want to learn some equanimity phrases that you can practice with. So just check that out in the email newsletter. It will also go up on Insight Timer pretty soon if you have that app. Uh, It usually takes a few days longer for them to kind of like approve it and publish it. But if you have the Insight Timer app, you should um, take a look there and you could listen to the equanimity meditation and also the patience meditation that I have up there. So also related to meditation, I am offering a free Mindfulness 101 workshop on February 26th. So I wanted to tell you about this and I will give more details at the end of the episode because I want to get into the topic pretty quickly here. But um, you can go check this out and register at my website, movedtomeditate.yoga slash events. So it's free. It's an online workshop. You get the Zoom link by registering, and you'll also get a recording of it in case you don't live in my time zone. (laughs) But this is just going to be a practical and down-to-earth introduction to mindfulness meditation, particularly for those who are new or new-ish or just kind of curious about starting a practice. We'll have a lot of fun exploring what mindfulness is and how to get going with a practice. So that's on February 26th. The website again is movedtomeditate.yoga slash events. So speaking of all this meditation, (laughs) today's topic is, so you think you can't meditate, part one. I started to write this up and realize it is more than one episode. Um, So this isn't really me trying to convince you that you should meditate. Like this is for if you're interested in meditation, and I hope it'll be helpful if you are interested, but you kind of just haven't found your way in yet, or you've sort of started and stopped and haven't really gained traction in your practice. There's some pretty common roadblocks, and I'm going to talk about these sort of mostly around our expectations and what we think counts as meditation when we're getting started. And then when I do the part two of So You Think You Can't Meditate, which will probably come out next month in March, 
I'll address some of the additional challenges like uh, being with pain or being with anxiety in meditation, which requires a little more sensitivity than these sort of basic roadblocks I'm talking about today. So this one is for you if you have tried meditating but felt like it didn't work for you or like maybe you were doing something wrong um, or if you stopped yourself from trying because you have a certain image in your head of what it has to be like and you're like, I'm not the kind of person who can do that <laughs> or it just doesn't seem like that doable for you. Personally, I have found meditation to be super nourishing and life enriching and for me, it's not like a, a thing that I think I should do. It's something that I enjoy and look forward to doing. It helps me calm down, for sure. It helps me gain perspective on things. I give my brain some space. <laughs> it helps me to show up and be more present in my life, which is very important to me. And it helps, you know, give me space, give me a place to kind of explore the big questions in my direct experience which I think is different than just like reading philosophy or thinking about things, contemplating things, right? On the abstract level, in meditation, we can actually kind of be experimental and see what our experience is actually directly and how close can we get to that and consider the big questions in, in our own personal context. So I started to practice mindfulness meditation about 15 years ago. Um, I got hooked right away. <laughs> and at that time, I had been doing yoga pretty regularly for a number of years. And the yoga made a huge difference for me. Absolutely. But I was still feeling a lot of stress at the time. And I decided that I needed and I wanted a practice that helped me work with my mind more directly, that had like techniques and methods and teachings specifically for that. And so then the meditation that I started to do really did help with stress, but it was actually way more than that. It was a lot more than I expected. And strangely, in kind of a paradoxical way, it was both the simplest thing and the most interesting thing ever. So I'm really, really grateful that I got started when I did. <laughs> so if you have tried to meditate and you've struggled, my first question for you is, what do you think counts as meditation? Does it have to be sitting? Does it have to be still? And if those are some of the images you're holding in your head, maybe you need to expand your idea of what meditation is so that you can find an entry point or a doorway in that works better for you. In mindfulness meditation or insight meditation, which is what I practice, we talk about practicing in the four postures. And this comes from a text, an ancient text called the Satipatthana Sutta, which is a foundational mindfulness teaching from the Buddhist tradition. So the four postures named in that text are sitting, standing, walking, and lying down. All are considered valid meditation postures, postures that we should practice being aware in. And if you think about it, they kind of cover all the different positions that we really could be in. So it's it's sort of like one way of telling us that the point of mindfulness is to bring it into all of our activities. Sitting is the most commonly taught. It's what most of us associate with meditation. But we can absolutely practice mindfulness while standing, while walking, while lying down and sitting. <laughs> and this teaches us, you know, it's not just a, this special event that we do on our cushion. <laughs> it's not just this thing we do in our formal meditation. And it's not always still. When we're doing a walking meditation, we're learning to be present while doing an activity, which is really useful for our daily life and for being able to bring our, our mindfulness into more aspects of our life. And then when we do think about sitting, sitting meditation, um, please consider that you can sit in a chair. <laughs> you know, some of us can sit on the floor and be comfortable, but many of us would have so much a better meditation experience if we would be willing to sit in a chair. The floor does not get you any closer to enlightenment, I, I promise. <laughs> uh, my teacher, who is one of the most advanced meditators that I have ever been around, ever, always meditates sitting in a chair. 
So, you know, get rid of that idea that you have to be sitting on the floor to meditate. You might want to choose a chair where you can be upright and fairly alert and like maybe not slunch down into your couch cushions. But <laughs> yes, you can sit in a chair. Yes, you can be comfortable and at ease and upright and alert at the same time. And in fact, that's really important. If you do choose to sit on the floor, please do not think you need to sit in lotus pose or any extra challenging posture. <laughs> not all bodies are set up for healthy lotus pose. Like just your hip joints might not be like wired for that. And that's totally okay. And more often than not, when I've seen people really get kind of hung up on wanting to do lotus pose, it's just becomes more of a distraction than anything. And it doesn't enhance their meditation. Yeah, I know some people who have the hips for it and who can sit like that and where it's a really great stable meditation posture, but for like 95% of us, it's not, okay? So <laughs> let's just let go of the idea that there's any like special posture or position that's a shortcut to tranquility and awareness, okay? So whew, let that one go. Um, and just think about, you know, we have all these postures. We have the different options for sitting meditation. We have standing meditation. We have lying down. We have walking meditation. They all have their gifts and their challenges. They all have a kind of different feel to them. And But one of them could be your best starting point, your best doorway into establishing your practice. And the only way you're going to know is by trying them. So I would say like an example of the gifts and challenges, right? Like if you choose to meditate lying down, that can be great. It can be more relaxing if you have a lot of aches and pains while you're sitting, like stabbing in your shoulder blades or your knees or whatever. That can really help to lie down and just kind of um, eliminate some of that struggle. But many people fall asleep when they try to meditate lying down. So that's the balance that we have to strike to kind of find the most optimal posture for us. It can totally depend on the day. Um, standing and walking meditation also offer a different experience energetically, being more upright, being you know in movement perhaps. So you have to try them out to know what's working for you. And it may be like, this works for me for now and later I will add more postures. So be open to that. And if you're interested in hearing more about walking meditation, I did an episode about that a while back. So you can just go back to the podcast page at movedtomeditate.yoga slash podcast and scroll back and find um, the episode about walking meditation. I think it's like walking meditation as moving mindfulness. So there's some instructions for it there if you're interested. And it's a great way to practice particularly for those of us who feel like it's hard to sit still. <laughs> um, so let's maybe consider, you know, along with this, especially if you feel like, I think I can't meditate because I can't be still, let's consider decompartmentalizing how we think about movement and meditation. Like, why do we think of movement as being totally separate from meditation? you can try doing a meditation while you're in a yin pose, right? So a yin yoga pose, it might be relatively still, but you're still in a stretch. You're doing a yoga pose, but you can take that time, that three or four or five minutes of your yin pose and be with your breath or do a body scan and think of it as a meditation and kind of get used to the idea of being in meditation and doing it in a place that's familiar, like a yin pose, if that's part of your practice. Another example is being mindful throughout a half sun salutation. Can you do your half sun salutations in a way where you're totally present, where you're feeling the sensations or you're with your breath in a really clear way? So if you can start to recognize some of these familiar experiences as meditation, you can start to expand on that. So that's kind of what I mean about decompartmentalizing or expanding what we think of as meditation. And then we have more confidence and more of a sense of like, oh, actually, I think I can learn this. <laughs> so to sum up this part, meditation does not always have to be seated and it does not always have to be still. And this is especially true speaking from the mindfulness tradition, 
Because in this tradition, our goal is really to develop awareness through our formal meditation, like through our designated practice times, so that we can bring it into all the activities of our life. It's not our goal to just become like expert meditators, but to develop awareness so that infiltrates and becomes part of who we are in all of our life. So that's the first piece, you know, what counts as meditation and in terms of postures and stillness or movement. And the next question I have is how long does your meditation have to be to count, (laughs) right? If you're trying to meditate for, you know, 30 minutes at a time as a beginner, you might be setting yourself up. (laughs) So how long does it have to be to count? It all counts. One mindful breath totally counts. That's true for us if we're beginners or if we've been meditating for 40 years, I promise. It all counts. And there is a cumulative effect when you can practice more. It does build up over time, becomes more of your way of being with more repetition and more time in the practice. But I would say when you start, Beginning with five to 10 minutes a day is excellent. And especially if you are trying to meditate and you're running into lots of physical pains, aches and pains, twinges, (laughs) if you're running into emotional overwhelm or kind of getting like um, anxious or you're getting kind of lost or frustrated, it might just be because you're trying to do too much too soon. It's a lot better to start with a little manageable amount and then build from there. So I would say five to 10 minutes a day. I started with five minutes a day at first and I gradually built myself up to longer meditations when I felt ready, right? It's not a race. This is a long-term practice. So start thinking long-term and let go of any like destination (laughs) with this. You know, that's one of the huge learnings of meditation in general. I also always tell people, I coach people in meditation and tell them it is better to do a little bit every day or almost every day than to do a lot once in a while. I would rather have you do your five minutes a day rather than do an hour once a week. You're going to have a better continuity through your meditation practice if you could develop the habit in these little bite-sized amounts consistently. So it's much better to do a little bit every day or almost every day than a lot once in a while. Over time, like over a few months, you might work yourself up to like 15 minutes a day. And then over a few years, months, years, Seriously, here's, you might find you even want to do more than that. The experienced meditators I know, and and like myself, I can easily do 30 or 45 minute practices at a time. Um, So yeah, it's totally possible, but it's not where you need to start. (laughs) You know, and like I said, it might be kind of counterproductive to even strive for that in the beginning. So be reasonable with yourself, be practical. And even with your 5, 10, or 15 minutes, it might be really helpful to start out with a guided meditation that can help you stay with it over that time and give you some technique and some structure. I love guided meditations for like learning a technique. And then once you know it, you can try to branch out to do the technique on your own and just set a timer. So then you guide yourself. And this is really good because as you go deeper in your practice, you're going to want to kind of have a little more room to use your intuition and to time things and to to kind of follow what's coming up in your meditation rather than just kind of sticking with what the guide is saying as they're saying it. So guided meditations are really useful, especially learning a technique and especially as you're getting started with your meditation. I do have some guided meditations, as I mentioned, on Insight Timer on that app if you want to check them out. And you can also find, I mean, they have like a gazillion meditations on there from other teachers. So you can totally find something that you like that's the right timing and that's the right tone of voice and the right pace. And try a few until you find something that um, really feels good and that you're going to stick with for a bit. 
So that's how long does your meditation have to be to count? Answer, it all counts. <laughs> and it accumulates over time. And the last thing I would say, if you've kind of struggled to get traction in your meditation or you're you're kind of intimidated by it, because it, it can kind of sound like lofty or really aspirational or like something you should be doing, I would say think about other experiences that you may have had already that you didn't recognize as meditation, but they're totally in that zone. Like if you have ever felt a sense of calm and focus during your yoga practice or while you're running or dancing or doing something creative or playing a game, right? With those moments where you kind of just like click in and you're just there, that's natural meditation. <laughs> Most of us have had an experience or two like that in our lives. And if you can kind of recall those and think about how did it feel? Was there a sense of clarity or ease or connection or kind of a sense of effortless focus? If you can recognize the feel of that, it can be a really helpful reference point for starting your meditation practice. Now, it's not that you want to get stuck on trying to recreate that exactly, because that is a trap. <laughs> but if you can recognize you've had some natural meditation experiences, it can give you confidence that you do have the capacity to be mindful. Everyone does, and you've probably had experiences of this already. So now that you recognize that, you can learn to cultivate that mindfulness more intentionally through a deliberate practice, which is so cool. You don't have to just wait to fall into that state of presence by accident. It's cool when that spontaneously happens, but what if you could access that way of being more often? Like, what if you had methods of developing and deepening that capacity? That's what meditation is for. <laughs> so these are some of my thoughts for you on getting your meditation practice started. And like I said, I'll do a part two soon for some of the more challenging experiences like pain and anxiety. But I do hope this gives you something to play with for now. And as I mentioned earlier, I am also offering a free Mindfulness 101 workshop in a few weeks. As you can tell, I love to talk about this and we'll be covering some different things in the workshop. And it's on Saturday, February 26th at 1.30 p.m. Pacific time. It'll be recorded for those of you who can't attend live. And I know some of you are in really far away time zones from where I am. Um, so you can sign up to get the recording if you want to participate. And if you even have questions in advance that you want me to address in the workshop, you can email them to me. So um, we will be going over some of the benefits of meditation um, according to some of the amazing science research that's been done on mindfulness, which there's a lot. And we'll talk about some of the myths and misconceptions about meditation, some of the things that get people hung up and derail practice. <laughs> and we will, of course, do some practice together so you have some experience of doing some mindfulness meditation that you can take with you. And it's just going to be really fun to talk about and share experiences and to ask questions and see where it takes us. So if you want to join me or get the recording later, please just head on over to movedtomeditate.yoga slash events and sign up there. It is free. It's totally free. You just have to put your email in so you can get the Zoom link. <laughs> and also, I would love if you share it with your friends who are interested in learning about mindfulness. So spread the word. Um, and let's all be moved to meditate together. <laughs> so I think that's it for now. And I'm really happy to be back with you and so appreciate you listening. And thank you for being here and hope you enjoy your practice and I'll see you soon. So that's today's episode. If you enjoyed this conversation, please share it with a friend and or leave us a review on Apple Podcasts and help others find us that way. To learn more about my work, the Moved to Meditate class library, live online classes, teacher trainings, and private lessons, go to movedtomeditate.yoga. Thanks so much for listening.